Right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Esri UK conference for 2017. Um, my name's Pete Wilkinson. I head up the professional services group at Esri UK. Um, and once again, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome everybody here today. Um, now this is our fourth year at this venue. Um, and once again, it's really exciting to say this is our biggest conference ever. Um, we've had close to 3,500 registrations this year. So that's absolutely fantastic. So thank you all for your ongoing support. Um, and, and a special welcome to those of you that are attending for the first time. Um, and I guess for me, that says something about the, the breadth and the spread of work that's happening in the GI industry in the UK today. So again, it's absolutely fantastic to see you all here, and uh, we're looking forward to a really exciting day. Um, so the theme of the conference this year is um, GIS enabling a smarter world. And as you will see during the course of the day, we really firmly believe that, that GIS has a huge role to play in, in making the world a smarter place. Um, so whether that's um, promoting sharing and collaboration, um, acting as a hub for real-time data feeds, um, engaging with field workers, or just some good old-fashioned classic GIS spatial analysis data management, we really believe all of those things can help make the world a smarter place. Um, and we've got sessions on all of those topics here today. Um, there's over 60 sessions in total. So we've got customer presentations, technical workshops, training seminars, a partner exhibition, lots and lots for you to, uh, to enjoy today. Um, there's a dedicated track for our developers on the fifth floor and also for our education community on the second floor. So uh, yeah, really hope you have, have a good day. Now just before we start, I also want to um, say a special thank you to Ordnance Survey, our platinum sponsor. Um, Nigel Clifford, the CEO of, of Ordnance Survey, will talk later this morning. Um, but I just want to acknowledge up front the, the long-standing partnership we have with OS and thank them once again um, for their sponsorship. Now, as I mentioned, the, the range of, of job roles, industries, technologies, organizations represented here today is quite fantastic. And, and one of the key aims of today is to provide a forum for all of you to, to share and to network with both us in Esri UK and also your, your peers and colleagues. So um, there's lots and lots of opportunities to do that. And one of the key ones is the, the conference app. So you may have seen the slides rotating earlier. If you haven't already done so, please do download the app. It's a great way for you to view the agenda, to help find your way around the building. Um, you can send messages to other delegates, and you can also set up meetings or demonstrations with, with Esri UK staff. So, so please do use the app. Um, there's prizes, once again, for the most active participants. Um, we love to see photos in the app, so send us some photos. But please use that throughout the day um, to stay in touch. And I guess the other thing just to mention is we don't want the discussion to stop at the end of today. We're really keen for it to continue. Um, we're increasingly pushing out information through social media. We've got some very active blogs. So if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the blogs, follow us on social media, and uh, we'd love to, to keep discussing stuff after today. Now, just before I hand over to Stuart, I just want to pick up on some of the exciting things that have happened since we, we were here this time last year. Um, arguably, the, the biggest thing that's happened is perhaps the release of ArcGIS 10.5. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about that now because there's all kinds of um, sessions on that later today. But, but suffice it to say, it, it's one of the biggest releases for many, many years and, and introduces a whole bunch of new exciting capabilities. So lo lots more about that to come. Um, but another key priority for Azure UK is, is what we call customer success. Um, that's about how we make you more successful in what you do um, and also make us easier to do business with. Um, and there's a few things I just want to pick out that we've done in the last 12 months. Um, the first of those is our new e-learning platform. Um, hopefully people are aware that, that Esri has a very strong track record in making resources available online um, and pushing out materials to help you understand our platform. Um, but at the end of last year, we released over 250 online training modules, which are free to customers on maintenance. Um, which, again, are designed to help introduce the platform and help you learn about all the key concepts. So, again, if you haven't done that already, please go and have a look on our website and, and track down the, the e-learning modules. Um, a second development this year is the launch of our new e-commerce platform. Um, again, increasingly, people want to purchase things online, work in a simple and uh, effective way. 
So e-commerce is a way to download some of our most popular products and services. You can pay online with a credit card. You can download it, and away you go. Um, I appreciate that doesn't work for everybody in the room, but if, it, if that is something that's of interest, um, that's now available on our website as well. And then finally, and, and arguably perhaps the most exciting um, announcement, is yesterday we launched our new online support portal. Um, so those of you that have raised support calls in the past, and we know that does happen every now and again, um, you've probably typically done that through telephone or through email. Um, we've now got a new online portal, which is part of the MyEsri platform that will allow you to do that. Um, you can submit support cases, you can look at historic resolutions, um, you can also manage your licenses, your users, and so on. Um, we've got a dedicated stand on the first floor for you to go and learn more about that portal and, and to sign up and register. So again, please find time to do that today if you can. So with that, um, welcome. I'm now going to hand over to Stuart Bonthrone, who's the Managing Director of Esri UK, and he's going to uh, introduce GIS Enabling a Smarter World. Stuart. Thanks, Peter. Good morning from me to everybody, and um, I'm absolutely delighted that so many of you could come again this year, and looking forward to a really great day. Um, the theme of the conference, GIS, Enabling a Smarter World, is a very grand statement. I just want to examine a little bit what we mean by that. We're living in a world that's rapidly changing, a world that's being wired up to everything, where with the Internet of Things, it's looking to measure everything that moves or changes in real time, providing streams of data from multiple devices. Many of you are using mapping and visualization, advanced analytics and 3D modeling to process and view that data. As a result of this, you're seeing new patterns emerge, gaining new insights, or perhaps just gaining a better understanding of how the world today actually works around us. Your understanding and knowledge is then supporting strategic decision-making, helping to transform operational processes, to make organizations more agile and more responsive. And through digital transformation programs, we're also seeing and solving many of the world's most pressing and complex problems. We're helping to deliver true operational efficiency that really saves time, saves money, and enhances customer service and support. So, as I said, the theme, Enabling a Smarter World, you can start to see how GIS fits into that. And I think through the course of the tracks today and the presentations today, you will see that. And today, you'll have the opportunity to meet the Esri staff to talk about the advancements in the Esri platform, in the ArcGIS platform. You'll be able to meet with our developer community who will be discussing how the new APIs and SDKs will help them to write much more powerful apps. You can meet the education team who are looking to inspire the next generation of advocates. And most importantly for me, and the most pleasing thing for me, is yet again this year we have a multitude of customers who are going to be demonstrating how they're using ArcGIS to drive success and innovation in their organizations. Data is the foundation of everything we do in the ArcGIS platform and need to understand the ever-increasing volume and variety of data is no longer a luxury, it's no longer a nice to have, but it's a need to have in organizations to run day-to-day -day business or to make decisions around the deployment of an emergency management team for a response to an incident. And in fact, if that's something that you're interested in, Later today, Nick Jones from the Environment Agency will be talking about exactly how they collect and share data around a live incident to provide a more co coordinated, get my teeth in, a more coordinated and rapid response. As we move into the era of the Internet of Things, with information constantly streaming from millions of devices from various locations, it raises a whole new set of challenges for us. And to support that, we need powerful technology to process that data, 
but we also need to be able to make sense of the data, to gain insights and to be able to act. And today, <coughs> excuse me, today at our smart data track with Beth and James upstairs, they're going to talk about how the advances in the platform have enhanced processing capability. And they'll also be looking at some of the open content that we can now get out of the box in Living Atlas. Every day, millions of very smart people are using GIS to explore multiple layers of data, to analyze complex scenarios and make decisions. And just after the break this morning, you can hear from Edith Landark, who from the land use consultants, who's going to talk about how she's using GIS to identify suitable land for use in sustainable housing projects. I think you'll agree, a really important topic in today's world. And with the advances in the platform and the development of ArcGIS Online, we're seeing more customers looking to share that data across the enterprise or to collaborate with field workers using mobile applications. If you're interested in understanding more about that, and more about how the platform can be used as a system of engagement, then we have a track being run by Joe and Katrina from Esri Island on smart collaboration, which I suggest that you go and have a look at. So at Esri, we like to think of GIS as disruptive technology. And that's because through hundreds of customers across multiple sectors, we've seen them drive innovation through transformation projects. And in today's main track, you can find out more about how customers are using advanced analytics to drive much higher levels of customer service and to transform paper-based, cumbersome paper-based processes into much more agile and modern processes. And how really they're using GIS to challenge the norm and to bring innovation into business as usual. So it's going to be a really full day, and thank you for listening to my short introduction. I'm looking forward to meeting with a number of you throughout the course of the day, and have a great day, and I'll hand back to Pete. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Stuart. Um, so now we're going to move on with our customer presentations, and our, our first speaker this morning is um, Zenon Hanick who's the Chief Technology Officer for, for Comic Relief. Um, so Xenon has spent over 10 years working with technology in various guises. Um, he started off in investment management, he then sold ringtones, and he spent the last seven years at Comic Relief, um, three of which as, as CTO. Um, now, I've, I'm fortunate to have worked with an awful lot of customers and seen some really exciting things that they do with our technology, but I have to say what I've seen Xenon's team do is, is one of the most exciting. Um, and this year, for the first time, while you were all watching Comic Relief, um, ArcGIS, there was, ArcGIS was there in the background, looking at the patterns of donations, looking at it spatially, all in real time. Um, you're going to see later this morning some more about that when Chris demonstrates our Insights product, user working with that data. Um, but first, just to introduce Xenon, here's a short video that reminds us all about Comic Relief. <laughs> Red Nose Day 2017, make some noise! It's only bad shit, huh? What? <laughs> Snail says, that's Michelle. <laughs> yeah, 24 hours of this. Oh, the cool kids are sitting on the oh. back of the sofa.
glad I made those stairs. That was my big worry. So um, thanks very much for the introduction, Pete. So a couple of things to clear up to start with. Um, first thing is, even though I'm from Comic Relief, there's not going to be many jokes in this, so I apologize for that to start with. And the second is, we do work more than one day a year, just to be clear about that. So uh, I hope you should all know Comic Relief, but essentially we're about kind of engaging the public, educating them, and then fundamentally fundraising money to change the lives of people in the UK and abroad. I've been CTO for the last three years, and uh, a large part of my role is bringing technology into the heart of, of Comic Relief. Essentially, the world is changing very rapidly, as you all know, and particularly for us, the kind of TV viewing figures are slowly going down, and we need to look at kind of into the digital world to see how we can uh, renew our brand and renew our interaction with the public. Um, a large part of that is around data. Um, we created a data team to help us uh, improve the way that we collect, uh, process, um, and analyze the data. Um, the key for that is for us not just to have data for data's sake, but really to, for it to be, allow us to become more evidence-based and data-informed in our decision-making. A large part of that is how you visualize data. As you can see uh, behind me, you'll see a couple of examples of some of the work the Esri, Esri team did in kind of showing where the money went both internationally and in the UK. I fundamentally believe uh, that there's two different types of companies in the world uh, at the moment. There's the organizations that are information and data enabled, and there's those that don't. And those organizations that have data at their fingertips that they can use to inform the decisions that they make, the strategies they, that they pursue, are the ones that are really going to win uh, when it comes out. So really, for us, it's about using data to tell stories, both internally to, to ourselves, for us to understand what's going on and better make, make better decisions, but also to our supporters. And really, the challenge that we have is that we have a yearly cycle, and we have a, a kind of seven, eight-week campaign that culminates in one night of TV. In that short time, we have to be able to turn data around quickly enough for us to make changes that will uh, get the maximum effect of our TV show. So um, Esri approached us uh, about six, seven months ago and, uh, and kind of came to us with a, with a proposition. They ha wanted to run a kind of day workshop with GIS professionals and kind of marketing agencies to kind of show how they could use um, their story mapping technology. And what they were looking for was for a challenge to, to, for those teams to work on uh, during that day. And so they came to us and we, ca and we came up with a This, man, uh, this Map Can um, day. And what happened was on that day, we had eight teams of marketing professionals and GIS, uh, GIS professionals, and they worked together over four or five hours to create, to create a story map. Um, the challenge that we set them was uh, they could choose one of two challenges. One was um, to create a, a, a web map that kind of showed where our donations went and how they'd made a difference in the world. And the other one was to use a story map uh, to create something on social media which helped uh, engage and, and fundraise. So the eight um, entries were fantastic, and the three winners came down to the one that you can see there with uh, Mark Watson, which was um, the map of funny. And this essentially used gamification to every region in the UK had a comedian who would tell jokes, and people would make micro donations in order to up upvote those jokes and see who was going to and see who was going to win. The second one was a day in the life of comic relief, which could easily have been re described a kind of day in the life of the money that the British public has raised, because that money uh, and you go through 24 hours and follow the money around the world and the difference that it was making. And finally, uh, we had Giving Her Hope, which was a very emotive story, uh, story map, telling the, the difference that we'd made in, in, in women's lives across, across the world. The fascinating thing for me was, and we take stuff for granted, I think we're all working technology and it moves so quickly, but actually to, to get a group of people together and within four to five hours to create a really compelling experience that was both unique and really uh, heartfelt. It's quite amazing. Uh, the out-of-the-box templates really helped with that. And the way that you could, particularly the last uh, uh, example, give her, give her Hope, was the way that you could get text, maps, video, data together to visualize and tell a story was really, really extremely powerful. After that, cheekily, we kind of said to Esri, is there anything else we could do together? Has it been such a productive and, and exciting opportunity for us? And they worked with us to kind of support the night of TV by creating kind of a richer uh, dashboard with richer data around what was going on. And so we created a proof of concept with BT and uh, Amazon Web Services, which would move beyond what we had already. We already had an operational dashboard which collects data from SMS providers, from our online donations, from our call center donations, and from IVR. And we kind of see the amount of money as it's coming in, and we, and we track that and respond to that. But we were looking to add an extra layer of kind of richness on top of that. 
So the first thing we did is we took the BT My Donate data, which our call centers use to take money, and we anonymized that, and we were pumping in real time uh, through all the donations with their postcode. Um, the Esri team geo geocoded that, and so we had a very quickly had a kind of a really detailed map down to the kind of postcode level of where the donations were coming in, the size of those donations, and the average donations. Now I had Nigel from my team who was sat there watching the show, and on his mobile phone he was just looking at the money, how the money was coming in across the country. And there was some really fascinating stuff that, uh, that we got from that. Um, post event, we went a little bit deeper into the data with the, with the Esri team, and they started looking at the size of the population in those areas, the average incomes, you know, f uh, m uh, kind of male and female and other demographic data to really help us analyze and segment where those, where those donations were coming from and how they worked. Uh, finally, we did a kind of, we added a social media kind of sentiment through, uh, through the night of TV to kind of analyze how, this, how the world was, was responding to our TV show like on a half by half hour segments. And that was really powerful for us. We're really working, we continue to work with the Esri team to see how we can explore that, that data further. So I suppose for me, the things that we learned as Comic Relief is we have always had our data. We've always collected data. We've had a lot of it right from the days when it would be a kind of six month turnaround loop for checks to come in and big, big bags and for Richard Curtis and volunteers to kind of pull those bags apart and start paying the money into the bank. Now, obviously, with the, the speed that the data comes in of our, our donations, it's much more real time, it's much quicker. So we have to both have the technology to be able to ingest that, but also to be able to understand it. And what I really felt, uh, uh, really understood really powerfully with the work that we've done with Esri, both on the hack day and in the work we were doing with the team post the event, is how important the visualization of that data is. Visualization em enables such powerful storytelling. And ultimately, that's what you need to do with data, is tell stories both to yourself to your colleagues and also to the, to the great British uh, public. And so marrying that concept of being able to take data in real time, ingest it, produce excellent looking maps, um, charts, information in a way that can really help you understand what's going on is ultimately what drives better decision making. And I, the, the whole day is all about the, uh, making us a smarter world and really it helped us make, uh, make our organization that little bit smarter and a little bit better. And it's those small kind of increases in understanding that allow us to, uh, to do that. So ultimately, the story mapping technology is really so powerful for me because it allows both that visualization and that ability to blend that into a really, uh, really um, powerful storytelling uh, dynamic, which I think in the digital, uh, digital world is going to be something extremely important for us as we go forward. So finally, I'd just like to thank the Esri team for all the time, they've, time and effort they've gifted us and say what an amazing success it was. And thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Xenon. And Chris, who was down this end, is going to come back later this morning in terms of the technology and uh, show in a bit more detail what, uh, what we've been doing with, with Comic Relief. Um, so now I'd like to welcome next uh, Nigel Clifford, who's CEO of um, Ordnance Survey. Um, so Nigel's been with Ordnance Survey since 2015, having previously worked in the IT, health, and telecoms sectors. Um, I'm also really pleased to say he's a geographer. Uh, with a degree in geography from Cambridge University and also a fellow of the, the Royal Geographical Society. Um, and I think like all geographers, he also likes being outdoors, which is good. Um, at OS, he obviously oversees their role as the National Mapping Agency for, for Great Britain, um, but is also evolving and expanding their product portfolio to um, tackle some of the, the latest things we're seeing, like autonomous vehicles and smart communities. So here to explain more is, uh, is Nigel Clifford. Thanks. <clears throat> so thanks very much for summarizing my talk. Uh, you can all have 10 minutes off. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me here to uh, speak this morning. Um, the, the title of the talk is kind of deliberately ambiguous. So am I talking about OS as geospatial leaders? Am I talking about ESRI as geospatial leaders? Actually, my intention is to talk about all of us in this room and in the rooms that are, this is also being beamed to as the geospatial leaders for Great Britain. And it's never been more important, as I, I think you've kind of already got a flavor of, and hopefully I'll give you a flavor as I go through, through my talk. 
So geospatial leadership, um, I'd like to touch on kind of our role in Ordnance Survey in terms of providing uh, some of the, the underpinnings for the geospatial ecosystem, and then talk a bit about our role collectively in ensuring that Great Britain gets the best possible geospatial offer. So clearly we've got a role um, as the National Mapping Agency, you know, hopefully providing trusted advice to, to government, both at a, a, a national, a central, a local uh, level. Um, and we do that through our, our collective mapping agreements, where I would imagine a number of you in the room are one of the 4,500 uh, public sector bodies who've got access to all of our data um, completely free. You can use it to make your portion of the United Kingdom as, as good as it can be. Um, it's also become really apparent how significant geospatial is when we start looking at the industrial strategy that was published earlier this year, where if you look at the, the pillars in there, you can kind of pin and string geospatial to most, if not arguably all of those uh, geospatial, uh, sorry, uh, industrial strategy priorities. But it's not just about looking at the public sector, it's also about providing um, fundamental geospatial assets to the wider community. Um, so as I say, people in this room, people beyond this room, um, and there's some good news there. I mean, firstly, uh, we're not idle. Uh, so in the last year, we've launched, with the help of our uh, local authority colleagues, uh, the OS Master Map Highways Network, so a brand new authoritative statement of uh, highways and, and byways across Great Britain. Um, also, the other good news is, uh, I think I can say categorically, this data has never been uh, more current, it's never been more detailed, it's never been more complete. So as an asset base, it's absolutely there to be used. So 460 million data points, 10,000, sometimes a lot more than 10,000 updates every single day going into it. So we're working hard to provide that, that underpinning platform for geospatial um, activity across the country. But unless you're a kind of statistics boffin, that's interesting, uh, but its use only comes with use. You know, its value is only um, created once it's actually being pulled out, shaken, and connected with more and more third-party data. So a real encouragement for you to bring your questions to our data, to apply your uh, information, your data sets, what you've got stored, connect it with our data, and get smarter answers to uh, even more detailed questions that you've got. And we'd love to hear from you. So if there are areas where our data isn't up to, uh, up to standard, where you'd like us to do additional things, um, then stop by our stand, talk to your account manager, give us feedback. And if you're a, a geospatial entrepreneur, then don't forget we've got a Geovation Hub, which is up in Farringdon, uh, and we'd love to hear from you if you've got a great geospatial idea that you'd like to nurture. So one of the um, areas that has been particularly active over the last year is around infrastructure, you know, infrastructure across Great Britain. And I'll, I'll talk um, some more about the, the areas that we've been involved with, but um, it can be, uh, I guess, categorized into whole new branches of infrastructure, so HS2 being put in place and planned, um, looking at optimizing the current infrastructure, so Victorian uh, cityscapes, how do we optimize our use of those? Um, and then finding new uses for established infrastructure, so looking at air quality monitoring and the use of uh, urban streetscape and um, uh, 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 the, the street furniture uh, that's already out there. So we've been very active, and if you were here last year, you'd have heard about one of the other things, that we, we maintain a curiosity about what might be next when it comes to the requirements of a national mapping agency, delivering data um, to you for your use cases. Um, and we spoke, uh, I think, last year about a number of these initiatives, which were just beginning to crystallize um, a year ago. But I can now give a, a bit more of a report as to how are they going. So in kind of reverse order, we've got Atlas, uh, which is a connected autonomous vehicle pilot, um, which is looking at the infrastructure of the future required to ensure that we can uh, be a, a very good place for people to bring their connected uh, autonomous vehicle um, trials from across the globe. So that's ongoing. 5G, um, really interesting um, activity down in Bournemouth, uh, sponsored by Department for Culture, Media and Sport, looking at how we plan the next generation of mobile. And the interesting thing for 5G is that it's very, very capacious. It's a great kind of mobile broadband, but it's very, very sensitive um, and very low power. So the amount of information you need on a um, on a street level is at, a, at a, a granularity which we've never seen before. So 
hanging baskets, um, looking at traffic signs, looking at foliage. You know, this is a whole new geography of, uh, of Britain. So really interesting learnings coming out of that. And then uh, the other one which has absorbed a lot of our time over the, the course of the last year is looking at CityBurb, which is the Internet of Things demonstrator up in Manchester. Um, and uh, so I'd like to spend a, a bit of time just dwelling on what that's beginning to tell us about the, the use of the Internet of Things, what a smart city might really be. Um, so we've had a team up there since last July uh, working in, I, I think, a really productive atmosphere for the, uh, for the trial and for a smart city. So we've got a, a progressive administration in terms of uh, Manchester Council. Um, we have got uh, seed funding from Innovate UK, which we're matching. Um, we've then also got um, very uh, engaged agencies, so health, education, transport, uh, all very focused on, on this particular portion of Manchester, about four uh, square kilometres. Um, and then we've got some fantastic partners. So it's a consortium of uh, just over 20 uh, partners, which include small, medium enterprises, right the way through to giants like Cisco, BT, and Ordnance Surveys in that mix as well. And we've been learning a lot. Um, so the, the job of work since last July has been uh, just flooding Manchester with geospatial goodness. So extracting uh, at a pixel level information about Manchester. Um, and so we've captured, you know, on top of our normal spec, about 40,000 point lines and polygons uh, across this four kilometre squared. Um, it's probably uh, the most detailed map that's ever been created of any portion of Great Britain, possibly rivaled by the Olympics back in 2012. Um, but the, the degree of detail has been quite extraordinary. Um, and what we're aiming to do is not just use this then to fuel individual use cases back, at the, um, back in the project, but also release a lighter version of this data into the uh, Open Innovation Project, which Man <laughs> Manchester run, so that individuals and companies can now begin to play with this data and come up with their own use cases. So things around personal mobility, personal safety, congestion, parking, a lot of transport use cases coming out of this first up. And one of the great things has been the, the collaboration that we've had with Esri. So as a long-term partner, long-term user of uh, Esri technology, um, it was kind of natural that we'd start to lean in some of, to some of the forward-looking Esri technologies as we went into this exercise. So using story maps as a way of um, uh, familiarizing the team, uh, the wider team, with the area that we were going to be involved with, uh, using the web app builder um, as a way of collecting and then depicting uh, the street furniture that we have. And our, our team, I think Nicola, who's here and will be on the, the saw, uh, found it really intuitive to use, a really easy uh, way into depicting the information. Um, we used Esri Online for the 3D, uh, for uh, promoting the 3D work. Um, and then we use the, uh, the collector for ArcGIS for our surveyors to collect the data and then be able to share it. So I think it's been a really good collaboration. So this gives you a, a bit of a peep over the horizon as to how we're going to be looking at this, um, of this nation of ours. And before we get um, you know, kind of too uh, nationalistic about this, well, let's have a moment of pride. This, uh, kind of the details don't matter on this. What you need to focus on is the, the left-hand side. It's a geospatial maturity review that was done by Geospatial World Forum back in January. The, the good thing for us as those geospatial leaders is that uh, the UK is second in the world, second to America. So you can have a coffee time debate as to whether that's fair. Um, <laughs> no comments from the audience, please. Um, part of the, the reason for that is that uh, America has got a very well-founded uh, geospatial industry, of which obviously Esri are part. Um, but on many other um, uh, aspects, so education, which you'll be hearing more about later, uh, data availability, use of open standards, all of those we scored really, really well on. So I think we, sh we should be proud as geospatial leaders that we've got this asset and we've got every opportunity to use it to the betterment of our colleagues um, and, uh, and in our workplaces. <coughs> so that's all good stuff. Um, however, we'd like to hear more from you. So please come to our stand. We'll show you examples of the, um, the work that we've been doing in Manchester. You'll get the opportunity to see some of the Esri technology working with, um, with our uh, data. And I'm sure you don't need a bribe, but I'm uh, also told that uh, you might be interested that we've got some uh, pin badges, which you might be able to access if you come up with good ideas for smart as you go through that. So I look forward to seeing you at the stand, and uh, I wish you a good conference. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Nigel. Brilliant. Th thanks, Nigel. And uh, yeah, I think the, the, the quality and volume of data for Manchester there is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and actually is a, is a useful transition into what we're going to talk about now, which is turning our attention to the technology. Um, so as I said at the start, um, this year we released ArcGIS 10.5, which is one of the most significant releases for, for many, many years. Um, we've introduced a whole bunch of new capabilities into the product um, and also released some new products, including um, the Insights application, some new developer SDKs. Um, so I'm now going to welcome Mark Wells from our technology group and some of the other guys who are going to showcase some of uh, the latest developments in ArcGIS. Great, thank you, Pete. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning. And, you know, as I know what's coming, um, I know that Chris here, Richard and Carmel have got some fantastic things to show you today. But just before we get to that, I'm going to spend a few moments um, talking about the ArcGIS platform. And as I do that, you might see um, over, over on this side of the auditorium, we've got John from Plowman Craven. He's, he's moving around. He's actually laser scanning you in 3D. So in the nicest possible way, pay no attention to him. And um, Richard is going to pick up on that story very shortly. You know, every year we come here and we, we talk about the fact that technology trends are changing. Um, there are new capabilities in the ArcGIS platform. And in fact, the rate of that change is accelerating. And you know, it's true. We'd be worried if that wasn't the case. Part of our role at Esri is to understand those technology trends. And it's also to understand the business problems that you're trying to solve, not only today, but also in the future, so that we can build the right capabilities into the ArcGIS platform to support you and allow you to do that. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you a little story. So make yourself comfortable, perhaps snuggle up to the person next to you, and enjoy this small tale of big data. You know, we've been talking about big data for a number of years now. This idea that we could begin to gain insight on vast data sets that were previously unintelligible by traditional means. And actually, for many of us here today, even before we were talking about big data, the challenge of maintaining large spatial data sets, that's not new to us. You know, to some extent, GIS has always been about this. So let me just put this into context for you a little bit. Every year, Gartner, the tech research company, they release what they call the hype cycle of emerging technologies. This is basically just a journey that technologies go through as they come to maturity. And they go through various different stages. And it goes something like this. You hear about a new technology. This year, there's genuinely an emerging technology called smart dust. Smart dust. It sounds pretty interesting, pretty exciting. I know nothing about smart dust. But what I do know is if smart dust is going to become successful, it will become very exciting. In fact, it will become too exciting and will reach the peak of inflated expectations. Now, I don't want to spoil the story, but it's pretty much downhill from here. because We realize, actually, perhaps smart dust isn't all it was cracked up to be. And you'll hear people saying, why do I need this smart dust? In fact, now I come to think of it, I already have plenty of regular dust. And we begin to reach the trough of disillusionment. Depths, the penny begins to drop, and that happens as practical applications come forward. Perhaps somebody invents the smart duster, and we think, oh, yeah, it's smart dust. This is the thing missing from my life. It gives my smart duster purpose. And we move up the slope of enlightenment until smart dust becomes an everyday part of life. So you might ask me, why am I telling you a story about dust? That's a fair question. Well, big data as an emerging technology took a very different path. It first appeared on this curve in 2010, and over the next few years, it made its merry way along the journey until, in 2015, it dropped off the curve completely. Now, Gartner explained this by saying, big data has quickly traversed the peak of inflated expectations, and it has become prevalent in our everyday lives. If you think about big data, rather than being a technology trend in its own right, it exploded into the very fabric of science and technology, and it now underpins many, many things that we do today and emerging technologies of tomorrow. If you think 
about the disparate nature of some of the things that are either powered by or generate big data. You've got things like the analysis of global financial transactions to spot that needle in a haystack of fraud, through to understanding and planning for the different power requirements for factories across different spaces and over time, through to tracking emergency vehicles in real time and responding to those key life or death decisions. You know, big data is just part of our everyday life already. And you might say, so what? What is the big deal about that? Well, here's the kicker for us. Much of this data is inherently spatial. In fact, it's very difficult to think of a big data scenario that doesn't have an element of location in it. Things happen in places. Let's take Intel as an example. You might have spotted earlier this year, Intel acquired the autonomous vehicle technology company Mobileye in a $15.4 billion deal. Now, they reckon that by 2020, each autonomous vehicle on the road will generate 4,000 gigabytes of data a day. Four terabytes of data every day, every car. This is big data, and it's spatial data. And it's not just Intel. Current thinking is that by the same time period, the Internet of Things will drive us to the situation where we have nearly 21 billion connected devices. This trend is only going to increase. And with research suggesting that maps and location-based applications drive engagement across all age groups, greater than any other category of application, we're now in a situation where data is being mined, information is being presented, and decisions are being made, all with the power of geography by the day, by the hour, and by the minute. And at Esri, the way that we understand the world and we strive to make it a better place is through this same power of geography. And to do that, we build something called the ArcGIS platform. Now, ArcGIS is advancing. Over the last year, we have been actively enhancing it, integrating and innovating in many new capabilities based on these trends that I've been talking about. So we've seen, as Pete just said earlier, the release this year of ArcGIS 10.5. We've seen the release of ArcGIS Enterprise, which includes new big data analytic tools for rasters and for vectors. We've seen releases of our flagship desktop product, ArcGIS Pro, with new enhancements, for example, in 3D editing, which Richard is going to show off to us in a few moments. We've seen quarterly releases of ArcGIS Online. We've seen new releases of the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs, and I'm going to speak more about those things in a few moments. Last year, Charles Kennelly, Esri UK's CTO, he stood here and he talked to us about the move from systems of record to systems of engagement. And Charles talked to us about how systems of record are what traditional GIS systems have frequently been. They're about main, maintaining authoritative data. They're about structure and controlled access. And how systems of engagement are about collaboration and communication, integrating social mechanisms to facilitate new things like citizen engagement and bringing together people from disparate places and information to create new learning. And really what this tells us about ArcGIS is that it can be used in different ways for different purposes. And over the last year, as we've developed the ArcGIS platform and we've released ArcGIS 10.5, we've actively developed it in a new way to be used. And that is as a system of insight. So what is a system of insight? We've heard a lot already about the Internet of Things and real time and responding to events as they unfold. Well, a system of insight is three things. Firstly, it is about that real time decision making, that ability to uh, equate what's happening and respond to those events on the fly. Secondly, it's about retroactive or historic analytics. This idea that we can use big data analytic methods to gain insight on large amounts of data that were captured in the past, but for one reason or another couldn't be understood at the time. And thirdly, it's about predictive or proactive analytics. This is the idea that we could use modeling techniques to understand the impact of our actions today on the future. And of course, we haven't forgotten all of the capabilities which ArcGIS provides to many of you, day in and day out. And I'm going to speak more about those things in a few moments. But before we get there, 
I'm going, I want you to see some of this new stuff in action. And so I'm going to hand over to Carmel, who's going to pick up this big data analytics story. And she's going to be looking at some of the new capabilities in ArcGIS Enterprise um, with geoanalytics and, and raster analytics driven from ArcGIS Pro. So, Carmel. Thanks, Mark. As you can tell, there has been a buzz of excitement for the release of ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5. I couldn't wait to get my hands on Geoanalytics Server in particular. Geoanalytics Server uses distributed computing to harness the power of multiple servers rather than relying on a single machine. This means we can perform bigger analysis faster than ever before. Our Geoanalytics instance is made up of multiple machines using Amazon Web Services. To show off Geoanalytics, we've been investigating reported crimes like burglary or antisocial behavior over the last six years. This was sourced from data.police.uk, an open data site about crime and policing from England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. These records consisted of over 3,000 CSVs. Before we perform any analysis, we need to make this data accessible by Geoanalytics tools. Through Server Manager, a big data file share is created to reference the folder structure containing those 3,000 CSVs. This approach has several benefits. Firstly, there is no need for the intermediate step of importing the data. Secondly, the files are only accessed when the tool is run, so the underlying data can be added to or changed without the need to republish. We can also partition a huge data set across multiple machines, which treating it as a single data set within Geoanalytics. Here is that raw reported crime data from the big data file share in ArcGIS Pro. That's 37 million crimes that have been reported in the last six years. However, all this shows us is that there has been a lot of crime reported in this time. Geoanalytics is going to do the hard work for us, allowing us to look past this static and get a clearer picture. The Geoanalytics tools are accessible in the same way other tools are across the platform. Classic tools like density and buffer benefit from the power of cloud. I'm using aggregate points to summarize our crime data. Aggregations can be based on size hexagons or squares, which can reduce oversampling, or you can use a polygon layer of your choice. Aggregating the crime data by counties is an option for authorities. A UK counties data set is available from the Living Atlas. The Living Atlas is an authoritative geographic it's a global collection of authoritative geographic data sets curated by Esri distributors. Aggregate points allows me to group this data by space and by time. In this instance, I'm grouping the data by months. The Living Atlas layers also provide extra attribution, like population. So I symbolize the aggregate points results by normalizing crime count by county population. Areas are now comparable in a meaningful way. Using the time slider, those monthly aggregations are visible. Aggregate points is a great example of how much faster analysis with Geoanalytics is. Using the standard spatial join tool, joining the 37 million crimes to 171 counties took 37 minutes. Using four Geoanalytics machines, the same analysis took just 80 seconds. That's 27 times faster than the standard tool. And without taking into account the time it would have taken to import those 3,000 CSVs into ArcGIS Pro in the first place. Using charting in Pro, I wanted to see if there were any temporal variations in the data. I generated proportional values by dividing monthly crime count by total crime count. Showing that total crime count over the six years, we can see peaks and troughs. Crime appears to peak in summer and dip in winter. I isolated burglary figures out of that crime data for comparison. Showing them side by side, you can see burglary also experiences peaks and troughs, but the pattern shifts, and burglary actually peaks in winter. The geoanalytics tools don't have to be used in isolation. For example, the Create Space Time Cube summarizes the crime data into space-time blocks. The ArcGIS Pro tool, Visualize Space Time Cube, displays these blocks in 3D. Patterns in space and time are starting to appear. Using that same geoanalytics output, we ran the ArcGIS Pro tool emerging hotspots, and those patterns were um, emphasized, and hotspots and cold spots were identified. Persistent and intensifying cold spots appear in northwest England and east London. This suggests crime has been on the increase. Conversely, 
Crime appears to be on the decrease where cold spots are identified, like Wales and Northern Ireland. I ran the same analysis by isolating um, burglaries again. As you can see, fewer patterns exist over the UK as a whole. London, Birmingham and Leeds are experience experiencing a decrease in trend in burglary. But Manchester and Newcastle are experiencing an increase in trend in burglary. Based on research from the UCL Dildando Institute of Security and Crime Science, a theory called repeat and irrepeat re victimization has been applied to burglary. From 20 years of empirical evidence, it's been found if a household has been burgled, it's at heightened risk of being burgled again in a one to two month period. Additionally, neighbors of that household are also at heightened risk. The properties are likely to be similar in design, burglars are already familiar with the area, and those neighbors are likely to have similar possessions worth stealing. The Geoanalytics Joint Features tool is going to put this theory to work. First, I join the crime layers to itself. So all crimes are looking at all crimes. Now, I only want to find crimes that have happened within 250 meters of a crime. Then, I only want to find crimes that have happened within a two month period. The joint condition allows me to apply a filter so only burglaries are analyzed within the total data set. This analysis determines if there's a sequence of burglaries close to each other in space and time. If we concentrate on Trafford and Manchester, I symbolize the clusters of associated burglaries in the same color. This kind of analysis has already been performed in Manchester by authorities on a smaller scale. By increasing the presence of police and raising awareness of burglary where these clusters appeared, there was a 27% decrease in burglary. Looking back at our emerging hotspots analysis, this decrease is reflected by diminishing hotspots appearing over Trafford. So this type of analysis was successful for Trafford, and I'm sure other authorities would want to see a similar decrease in burglary and indeed all crime. The ana this analysis cannot be completed in isolation. Repetition is key to keep on top of current trends and patterns. As data grows, geoanalytics makes this repeated analysis achievable, allowing authorities to be more tactical, insurance companies to determine fair quotes, and aid councils developing safety schemes. So let's hope the only crime you encounter today is ArcGIS stealing your hearts. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Um, <laughs> let's check out what's new for Raster in Enterprise 10.5. In ArcGIS Pro, we have two imagery data sets for Great Britain from 2015 and 2017. The data was clap captured by the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellite. Sentinel-2 collects 10 meter resolution imagery, multispectral imagery for the whole Earth every five days, and is freely available to public bodies. How do you think your organization could take advantage of this? Maybe tracking land use change, or monitoring habitat destruction caused by urban sprawl. I'm gonna show you how Image Server can make the handling and processing these large data sets easier. Each of these mosaic data sets are over 50 gigabyte in size and made up of 55 different rasters. By mosaicing these rasters together, um, single continuous layers are created for visualization and analysis. Taking a flying visit to Stansted, we can see the seasonal differences in the data, with the 2017 data captured pre-harvest and the 2015 data captured post-harvest. Image servers used to publish the, serv the data out as web services, which can be accessed on client applications like ArcGIS Pro. The data can also be viewed in browser-based applications, like the ArcGIS Online and Portal for ArcGIS Map Viewer. Image services expose image display settings, allowing you pixel-level access to your raster data. Display band combinations can be changed on the fly, or preset renderers can be selected. For example, NDVI is an index that can assess vegetation quality. If we head on down into Edinburgh, which is one of the greenest cities in the UK, the, the NDVI renderer reflects this, with green areas like Arthur's Seat and the meadows being recognizable. These imagery layers are stored using Azure Cloud Storage, but Amazon Web Services are also an option at 10.5, leveraging the easy scalability of cloud. This cheap storage makes storing massive data sets like this viable. By pairing Azure Cloud Storage and an ArcGIS Enterprise and Image Server deployment on Azure, it means you can share your roster holdings across your organization without the need to procure and maintain your own infrastructure. 
Like GeoAnalytics, the raster analysis tools are accessible from the Analysis tab in Pro. A subset of these tools can be run in the Map Viewer as well. Raster functions are applied to the Sentinel-2 imagery to create brand new inputs for analysis. My goal is to analyze the, the solar potential of Great Britain to figure out where is, best, uh, where is best to locate a solar farm at a regional level. A custom model was created for this analysis, which take, oh, um, I used raster functions um, on the Sentinel-2 imagery to classify the um, Sentinel-2 imagery into seven different land use types. Aspect and slope were generated from OS to RAIN-5. The Met Office provided rasters for rainfall, sunshine hours, and temperature. A custom model was created for this analysis. A custom model was created for this analysis, which takes those inputs and applies further raster functions to them, like remap and multiply. The model result can be saved locally, which means it's processed on the fly each time it's displayed to the renderer. Or, in our case, the result is a brand new service sitting in ArcGIS Enterprise. This is that result. One might assume that the south of England would be well suited for solar farms, but actually, a large amount of the land is discounted because it's already developed on. Combining Azure Cloud Storage, the processing power of Image Server and ArcGIS Pro means analyzing these massive data sets is a lot quicker than using just ArcGIS Pro alone. Of course, this is only high level analysis, but the same workflow can be applied right down to submeter accuracy. Distinguishing the suitability of one rooftop from its neighbors from high resolution imagery and without making unnecessary site visits is pretty cool. At the, rate data, at the rate we're receiving high quality imagery and potential outputs generated from them, Image Server is key to helping you manage uh, your organization, manage and work with them. So let's move over to Richard to have a look at big data a little closer to home. Thank you, Carmel. So Carmel's just shown us how we can work with large volumes of both vector and raster data. So following on from this, I'm going to talk about a different type of big data, point clouds which are continuing to, advan um, to continuing to benefit from advancements in the ArcGIS platform. In essence, point clouds are simply a large collection of point features positioned in 3D space. And they're an amazing way to capture really detailed information about the world around us with relatively little effort. The increased availability and falling prices of laser scanners has caused a surge in people using point cloud data and the variety of ways they're using it is increasing at an equally rapid rate. So we're starting to see point clouds used in areas such as BIM for gaining a deeper understanding of buildings and for bringing the interiors of buildings into GIS, or for construction where it can be used for managing large stockpiles of materials. Point clouds are also great for assessing change over time when you're looking at things such as erosion or structural integrity. So to show you how quick and easy it is to use point or to capture point cloud data and then get using it in ArcGIS, we're going to do just that now. That's why we've had John walking around the room. John's from Plowman Craven, and they're a leading force in the world of surveying. So we called upon them and called upon their expertise for a very special job to laser scan all of you. John's using a device called the Zeb Revo from our partners GeoSlam to undertake this survey this morning. And once the data is ready, we're going to load it into ArcGIS Pro, ready to show you in the closing plenary this afternoon. So for now, I want to use a different data set um, to show you point clouds in ArcGIS Pro. So a few days ago, we came to the QE2 center with Plowman Craven to undertake a survey and generate a point cloud of the third floor and of the exterior of the building. The survey took around two hours to complete using the two devices that you can see over here. Um, sorry, yes. <laughs> so let's jump into the demo now. So before we jump into the point cloud, I want to create some contextual data for our, our model to sit within. And to do that, I'm going to use some of the newest features of ArcGIS Pro. And just in case you're wondering, this is still ArcGIS Pro. I'm just using the dark theme, which is really great for reducing eye strain in low light environments like this. And it also looks pretty cool. 
So as you can see here, I have some building outlines. I generated these automatically in City Engine using OpenStreetMap data. But of course, we could use any data we, if we need higher accuracy. So if I zoom in here, we can see that we have the QE2, the building we're all in now. But it doesn't look too much like the building does in real life. And to fix this, I'm going to use the new 3D editing capabilities. The first thing to notice about the building is that it's too low. So there's a couple of ways we could fix this. The first way is I could simply extrude the building upwards. And with these new tools, you can see that's incredibly easy to do. But if you look at the QE2 in real life, each of the floors is actually a different size. And some of the upper floors are wider than the lower ones. So having a single block of information like this isn't going to quite do the job for us. So I'm going to use a different tool instead, a tool called Duplicate Vertical. This is going to let us create a set of discrete floors and then edit them all individually. So we can choose the number of floors that we want, in this case, four additional floors, and the offset for the distance that they are apart, in this case, seven meters. So once that's done, I can head around to the front of the building. And I can start editing these floors one by one. Again, really easy to do. But how do I know how much to, to scale each of these floors? I could look at a photo of the building, but that's probably not the most accurate thing to do. So instead, I'm going to utilize that point cloud that we captured the other day. So let's load that in. OK, so now I could start digitizing against this point cloud and create something much more accurate, something like this. As one final step to finish this off, I want to create the courtyard that's actually in the top floor of this building. So as well as um, extruding and scaling these features, we can also create our own vertices. So let's move up to the top of the building and select the vertices tool. And now I can literally on the fly just start drawing the features as I need them. And we get these nice guidelines to make sure that we're editing in straight lines. And once that's done, we can simply extrude it up. Or in the case of this building, we can pull it down to create our courtyard. So you can see that it's easy to get um, a realistic representation of the building. But if we were aiming for a high level of accuracy, it's going to be quite labor intensive. And that's really where our point clouds come in, because the accuracy to time ratio is much more favorable. So let's jump into this point cloud. So here we have the third floor, and the one that we're all sitting in here, in a little over 300 million points. So think how powerful it is to have this high level of detail, geographically correct and in three dimensions. No matter what your real world assets are and whether they're permanent or ephemeral, we can capture them at a moment in time for us to use in ArcGIS. So getting the data into ArcGIS was as simple as adding the LiDAR files as a last data set. And that's a really quick way to start working with the full resolution data. But in order to get the most performance out of our point cloud, we use the Create Scene Layer Package tool. And this gives us a very fast and efficient format. The other benefit to using this format is that it works throughout the platform. So if I jump across to ArcGIS Online here, you can see we have the exact same point cloud running in a web browser. That's a really new feature, and it's particularly powerful because it means that you can share your point cloud with anybody, regardless of if they have GIS software or not. So let's just jump back to Pro and have a little bit of a look at how we can utilize this point cloud. I'm going to head over to the left-hand side of the stage here, where there's actually an access point. So let's say we want to get some particularly large or heavy materials into the building. In ArcGIS Pro, we can use the measure tools. And they work in 3D because they snap to the actual points of the point cloud. So I can make a measurement across here. We have 1.43 meters. And I could equally be digitizing features and, again, snapping to these points in the same way. 
Okay, so we know that we can fit the materials through the door. Let's get a little bit more insight out of this. And to do that, I'm going to change the symbology. At the minute, we're symbolized based on RGB, or red, green, and blue. And that gives us a true-to-life color. But there's various other ways we can symbolize this, including elevation. So using this view of the elevation, I can see that as well as the door being big enough to fit the materials through, we also have some slopes to get it down to the ground level. And you can imagine where this would be very useful in something such as an archaeological survey, where you really need to get fine-grained detail of the surface. So I hope that's given you a good taster of um, how powerful ArcGIS has become in the realm of 3D. And don't forget to come back in the closing plenary this afternoon, where we're going to finish off our empty building by adding all of you into it. And with that, I'm going to hand you back to Mark. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> so Richard's just shown there some of the new capabilities in ArcGIS Pro. And prior to that, we saw Carmel driving some of the new uh, big data analytic capabilities in ArcGIS Enterprise. So I'm going to move on and talk about the capabilities uh, of the ArcGIS platform. These are the things that ArcGIS provides for you to actually do GIS, no matter where you access them from. Now, the first one of these, perhaps obviously, is mapping and visualization. But as Xenon has already told us this morning, this is a really important area of the platform. You know, we have a big focus on, on smart mapping, the idea that the map can um, present your data with intelligence and help you gain insight by default by choosing sensible renderers for it. And you'll see much of that happening today. Another area of focus for us is 3D. 3D really now goes across the whole platform. We've seen Richard showing um, the editing capabilities in ArcGIS Pro. You also saw 3D in ArcGIS Online with web scenes and point clouds. And it also exists in our runtime SDKs for mobile devices as well. Really, with 3D, we're seeing a move from pure visualization to performing analysis as well. And it's becoming just a normal way for us to work with data, and people are making use of it. The Living Atlas provides a rich vein of content to power your applications. You know, when you place your data in a wider context, it helps you gain additional insight about it. And with the Living Atlas, you've got access to things like base maps and imagery, demographic data, near real-time content like um, live traffic information, and the ability to route over that. You've got access to terrain data and hundreds of open data sets. The Living Atlas is not only available in ArcGIS Online, but you can also connect to it through ArcGIS Pro, like Carmel's already shown us. And it's also accessible from ArcGIS Enterprise with enhancements on how you access that at 10.5. Apps connect to the platform, and they make things real for you as a user. We have a suite of applications in ArcGIS, and increasingly, our strategy with making apps is to take simple targeted workflows, wrap them up, and provide them as an application into the context that a user is familiar with working. And if you want to do that yourself and build on the applications that are already out of the box with ArcGIS, you've got access to the app builders, so Web App Builder on the web, and App Studio for native devices and platforms. And if you want to go one step further than that, ArcGIS supports all of the common development languages and scripting tools. In fact, this year we've seen uh, the new release of the ArcGIS runtimes, um, which standardize consistent capability um, and release schedules across all of those platforms. So you can find out more about that on the developer floor. Analytics, I mean, ArcGIS has always been about spatial analysis. And really, we're still innovating in this space. At 10.5, we've built a brand new application from the ground up. We've actually had to design new ways to store and query data. And we've designed new user uh, experiences for you to drive that as well. We're really excited about this product. It's called Insights for ArcGIS. And in a few moments, um, Chris is going to show us a bit more about that. Real time, I've already touched on real time a little bit today. Really, as we've designed real time into the ArcGIS platform, we've done it for two purposes. The first is real time to allow you to take account of what is happening, what is changing, and make key decisions and respond to events as they unfold on the fly. But the second is real time as a data capture me mechanism, you know, being able to take that data and store it away for low level batch analytics later. And low level batch analytics is where geoanalytics fits in, as Carmel's already shown us this morning. 
you know, this ability that which we've brought in at ArtGest 10.5 in ArtGest Enterprise, um, this ability for us uh, to break down spatial problems that would have traditionally taken um, weeks or days into hours and minutes. And we've completely redesigned these tools for big data, you know, taking advantage of big, big data techniques um, to provide these into ArcGIS. And the same is true with Image Server. So many of you will be familiar, familiar with Image Server before ArcGIS 10.5, but at the new release, we add in raster analytics on big data as well. So really, there are many, many capabilities in ArcGIS. And the way that we provide those to you is we build the ArcGIS platform. And the platform exists in three conceptual tiers. Firstly, it's a platform built on services. And services supply everything to um, users. They supply things like access to data and content. They supply analysis. And really, these services are then brought together in the portal. Now, the portal understands and indexes these items of content. It also knows a little bit about users and who's got permission to see what, and it disseminates information accordingly and securely. And then we have the top tier, the applications. You know, applications take these tangible things like maps, layers, and scenes, and they take them and make them real in a context that you're familiar with. And it's really this ecosystem of apps connecting to the portal, underpinned and powered by services, which makes ArcGIS a system of um, engagement. And to get access to this full suite of technical capability, you're going to be looking at ArcGIS Enterprise, which is really a wrapped up deployment of the ArcGIS platform on your own infrastructure, whether that's in the cloud or on premises. At 10.5, ArcGIS Enterprise is the evolution of ArcGIS Server. You know, ArcGIS Server is a well established, capable, and stable technology. So you might ask, well, why have we changed the name then? Well, really, it reflects that ArcGIS Enterprise goes beyond ArcGIS Server alone. You know, at the heart of ArcGIS Enterprise is still the GIS Server, this piece of technology which has now been released, invested in, and refined over more than a decade. But alongside that, we're bringing the new capabilities that we've been looking at today. You know, these big data analytic tools and enhancements in real time. And really, with ArcGIS Enterprise, you've got the choice to deploy the components that you need. So if, if the GIS server is what you need, you bring that out, and then you bring the other components around it you know, as your requirements evolve. ArcGIS Online is our software as a service system. You know, at Esri, we genuinely believe in the power of GIS to help us understand and influence the world. And the nice thing about ArcGIS Online is, um, because it's software as a service, it can tell us something about how many people are getting um, benefit from a GIS or a geographic approach. So let's have a look at some of the stats in ArcGIS Online since we released it in 2012. So here we've got some information about the number of organizations that have got access to GIS. Many of you here today will have access to ArcGIS Online, and you do that through an organizational account. Worldwide, we have over 265,000 organizations that are gaining benefit from a geographic approach. That constitutes over 4 million individual users, which is up from 3 million at the same time last year. So that's a good story. I like this graph because it really tells us something about the rate of change, the rate of adoption of GIS. Um, this is the total number of items that are stored in ArcGIS Online. Now, we know that there are more organizations and more users making use of GIS. But actually, if they were doing that at a consistent rate, we'd expect this graph to be a straight line. The fact that it curves up shows that the rate of adoption and usage is growing. So that's exciting as well. And then finally, let's look at base maps. This tells us about the number of base maps which ArcGIS has served since we released it in um, September 2012 on a month-by-month -month basis. Now, in March this year, which are the latest stats that I have, you requested 18 billion base maps from ArcGIS Online. Just think about that for a moment. 18 billion individual map requests. That is a phenomenal number. And to put that into some context, in March 2016, last year, we served 9 billion base maps. And if you look over year on, the whole year, year on year, since 2012, we consistently see an increase of between 60 and 70% growth in the number of base maps that get requested. Now, you can't fail to notice there that there are two spikes 
um, at the end of this chart here. I wonder if anybody knows what those might represent. What were you doing between perhaps July and September last year? Who said Pokemon Go? Were you caught up in the phenomenon of Pokemon Go? If you were, perhaps you remember this website, Pokevision, yeah? Pokevision was a website that began to plot the locations of all the Pokemon that people were finding. And it became very popular very fast. And so actually this was quite exciting for us because it drove usage of ArcGIS and we saw more base maps coming out of ArcGIS Online. But then we realized, actually with our hearts in our mouths a little bit, you know, we're talking about a rate of increase here, which, which is in the billions. We're talking about pretty much overnight, going from 10 billion base maps a month to nearly 22 billion base maps a month. And so what happened? Well, nothing. ArcGIS Online just worked. It just scaled. It served all of the requests that it was asked. And really, this tells us something important about systems. We can increasingly rely on the systems to do what systems do. You can rely on ArcGIS to be there, to be stable, to be serving the requests that you require. Meanwhile, we as GIS professionals are free to focus on the things that we're good at and that we're passionate about, things like driving the tools and understanding the data and providing that insight back to our businesses. And if you haven't guessed what that second spike is, it was when this chat became particularly popular in the US although the data suggests not quite as popular as a bunch of imaginary creatures. I'm going to move on quickly. Let's talk about access to the platform. We call this named users or identity in ArcGIS, and we've been talking about this for a few years now. But at ArcGIS 10.5, we've listened to your feedback, and we've released a new type of user. We call it a level one or a viewer named user, and it's available at a lower cost. So what's the difference? Well, a level one user is essentially an entry point into the ArcGIS platform. Perhaps you have users in your organization who only need to be able to visualize data, and maybe they don't need access to create content or drive applications. That's where a level one user sits. And for everything else, we have the existing user, which we now call a level two user. Really, this just reflects the fact, as I said earlier, that increasingly ArcGIS is used for different purposes by different people. And it's also a good example of how we've listened to what you're saying, we've responded to your feedback, and you've helped to influence the direction of the ArcGIS platform. So thank you for that. ArcGIS Pro is a core part of the ArcGIS platform. It's our next generation GIS desktop tool. And you are increasingly using it for creating authoritative content, um, for, for authoring maps, for performing analysis in 2D and in 3D, to connect to portals and online uh, and drive additional workflows and many, many other things. This year, we've seen the release in ArcGIS Pro of version 1.3 and then 1.4, bringing enhancements in capability like the 3D editing that um, Richard has already shown off. And really, ArcGIS Pro is the future for us. It's the future of desktop GIS. So if you're not already using it, I'd really encourage you to pick it up, take your data and workflows into it, drive that through, and please do continue to give us your feedback. ArcGIS Desktop, ArcMap is still there. It's still available and supported. But really what we're saying is things are moving towards Pro, and ArcGIS Pro is the future. So do continue to engage with us today and beyond on that. So we've talked today a lot about gaining insight on our data using new and existing parts of the ArcGIS platform. And I've already talked a bit about Insights for ArcGIS, which is this new application we've launched at ArcGIS 10.5. So here to show us more is Chris. He's going to pick up the comic relief story from earlier and show us how we can gain insight onto, into some of that data um, using uh, some of the new tools. And uh, that data was actually captured as Xenon said, in real time on the night a few weeks ago. So, Chris. Thanks, Mark. So we heard Xenon from Comet Relief earlier talking about how they use Esri technology to visualize their data and make informed decisions. We saw the dashboard Comet Relief used throughout the Red Nose Day broadcast to monitor donations across the country. This was created through a combination of GeoEvent Server and ArcGIS Enterprise. As donations came in, we used GeoEvent Server to ingest the data and aggregated the donations into hex bins at multiple scales, the same technique we saw Carmel use earlier. This helped us make sense of the tens of thousands of donations received throughout the night. 
The services could then be accessed in Portal for ArcGIS, and we could exploit the timestamp within each donation record using the time slider widget in Web App Builder, so we could visualize the donations in real time. Using GeoEvent, we were also able to create a service of uh, average donation in each hex bin. Although we only ingested the data into GeoEvent server once, we were able to produce multiple results and layers of inf information simultaneously. So it's great to see how donations came in throughout the night, but it raised some questions we wanted to find answers to. How do demographics affect donations? Are there any localized patterns? How can we optimize workflows and maximize donations? Insights for ArcGIS can help us make sense of these questions. Insights for ArcGIS is a browser-based analytic workbench where you can explore spatial and non-spatial data, answer questions, and deliver powerful results. It utilizes the full power of GIS whilst reducing technological complexity. It integrates with enterprise data from multiple sources and also leverages Esri's vast ecosystem, including authoritative data available in the Living Atlas. It's optimized for fast performance, allowing for a new type of visual data exploration, something we refer to as exploratory analysis. Projects are stored as workbooks, recording all of your data-driven workflows and results. In Insights, I can visualize my data by dragging and dropping it into a card. The card on the left is a map card, showing all donations made by phone or online throughout the Red Nose Day broadcast. There are 185,700 individual points on the map, and it's difficult to draw any conclusions. We can use district-level demographic data to start to make sense of these donations, which we can see in the map on the right. If I drag my demographic data on top of my donations, I can perform a spatial aggregation. When the aggregation is complete, the map card will be more than just a visual. Insights will have created a spatial relationship between my donations and demographic data, and calculated statistics on donation count, amount, and average in each district in the UK that I can then use for further analysis. Notice that Insights has also symbolized my data with smart mapping. I have options to change my symbology. For example, I can create a choropleth of donation counts in each district and start to make sense of my data. In Insights, I can drag attributes from my data sets onto a card to use alongside maps. For example, I can drag average donation and purchasing power onto a chart card and visualize the, uh, the relationship between the two. I can then symbolize it in different ways. We can see that as purchasing power increases, so too does the average donation. If I select the points on the chart with high average donations, we can see areas in central London highlighted on the map. The central London areas with a high purchasing power on average donate a higher amount. But what happens when we take into account population? Are donations still proportionate? The map on the left shows the average donation per person in each district, calculated from the total donation in each district divided by the total population in that district. And we can already see a different pattern. The chart on the right can help us make sense of this. On the x-axis, we have purchasing power, representing how much money people have to spend. On the y-axis, we have average donation per person. In general, we can see that as purchasing power increases, so too does the average donation per person. Interestingly, however, at the higher end of purchasing power, the average donation per person drops significantly. If I select these points on the chart, we can see areas in central London highlighted again. The central London areas um, with uh, so what our extra level of analysis and insights is showing us is that although these donations are large, they're few and far between in these areas. And one thing's for sure, donations aren't often made in Chelsea. Data doesn't always have to be spatial. Maps are great, but charts can tell us a completely different story. I can quickly visualize donations over time to see what drives donations and what doesn't. For example, I can drag my donations and time onto a chart, and it insights plots a bar chart. It's not quite what I'm after, but with one click, I have access to other ways to visualize my data. I can create a line chart of donations over time to see how donation velocity changed throughout the night. As I have two methods of donation, phone and online, I can group the line chart to see how these two methods of donation varied across the night. I also have a timeline of key events below. 
major appeals and broadcasts. We can see on the line chart peaks and troughs in donations over time, and these peaks and troughs follow the key events. For example, we can see an increase in donations shortly after David Tennant's malaria appeal. The largest peak in donations falls in the last 10 minutes of BBC One broadcasting, where there is a push for donations before the switch over to BBC Two. Preceding this spike is a slump in donations, which coincides with the broadcast of the Love Actually sequel. People are watching TV rather than making donations. So now we understand how appeals drive donations, it would be interesting to see if appeals closer to home can have localized effects. At eight o'clock, there was an appeal by a mother and daughter from Bradford who went to Nairobi to see how donations could change lives. Did this have an increased effect on donations in Bradford? In my map, I have donations around the time of the appeal at a national level. If I flip the card, I can see that the maximum donation was 20,000 pounds. I can filter donations to remove anomalously high amounts. In this case, I'm only interested in donations of 1,000 pounds or less. As this filter is at the data level, everything on the page updates. In the chart, we can see, after the appeal, an increase in donations at a national level. As I'm interested in Bradford, I can filter spatially. I have the boundary for Bradford, and if I drag it onto my donations, I can filter by extent, immediately filtering donations to the Bradford area. I can then take these results and create a new chart for Bradford. We can see a much larger increase in donations in Bradford following the appeal. This is clearer in the chart below, which shows the percentage change in donations following the appeal. Bradford, in orange, shows a 1,200% increase in donations following the appeal, dwarfing the increase at a national level, shown in blue, of around 450%. With insights, we have shown how this appeal drove donations at a local level, way above the national average. Now I've done all this analysis, I can switch to the analysis view. This records the steps that I've taken in my analytical process. I can edit, use, and share this model to automate common tasks. For example, I can rerun my analysis for another area of the country, and everything downstream automatically updates to reflect this change. Insights pages can be shared across your organization and embedded in out-of-the-box applications and websites. Sharing follows the same rules we used to in ArcGIS Online. You can share privately within your organization with named user access, or publicly to show everyone your analysis. For example, you can share insights pages as part of a story map alongside other applications and media. This story map goes through everything I've shown you in the last few minutes. It allows the reader to understand the steps that I've taken and how I've reached my conclusions, whilst providing the ability to interact directly with the data and maps. Thank you for listening. Now back to Pete. Great stuff. Well done, guys. Um, I mean, we've been trying for a long time to make GIS more accessible and encourage more people to use GIS. We really feel Insights does that. It really is very exciting. So maybe later today, head outside, find one of the demo booths, and, and see if you can speak to someone about what Insights might be able to do for your organization. Um, so just to wrap up the morning session, just before we head into the, the coffee break, um, we want to make quite a significant announcement. Um, Hopefully you're aware that from an Esri perspective, we really feel supporting schools and education is important. Um, as you might be aware, GIS is now part of the national curriculum. Um, and we've been working with a number of organizations, including the Royal Geographical Society, to champion that. And, and, and hopefully you agree with me that I think it's in all of our interests to promote the use of GIS and encourage young people to use our technology. Um, so with this in mind, in a moment I'm going to introduce Rita Gardner from the Royal Geographical Society um, to make this announcement. But just before we do that, I want to run a short video which explains how one school, which is Dover Grammar School for Boys, is using GIS.
hopefully running a video of uh, Dover Grammar School for Boys. Do we have the video? Well, Rita, do you want to come up now and make your announcement, and we'll explain more about what Dover Grammar School for Boys are doing in a moment. So this is Rita Gardner, Director of the Royal Geographical Society. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to make an announcement which is really an announcement for ESRI and relates also to the partnership between ESRI UK and the Society, and to ask your, for your help. This is a call to action to everybody in the room to support what is the most amazing initiative. Um, I'm here as the director of the RGS IBG um, with, the, with the Learned Society and the professional body for geography. And that, of course, includes many GI specialists. For those of you in the audience who don't know anything about us, we have a stand here. Come and find out, join, become a chartered geographer, for example. But the Society and Esri have a strong, long, effective partnership in support of school education. And so I'm honoured and delighted to be here this morning. Um, as you will see when you look at the Dover School video, um, there are teachers and students, uh, many of them, who are passionate geographers and passionate about the power of geographic information and GIS. And like them, I'm passionate about that too, whether it's in business, in society, or in our own individual lives. And there are two key initiatives that are being launched this morning. Um, individually, each of them is important. Together, they are groundbreaking. One of them is free access to schools, all schools in the UK, but particularly to secondary schools, but to all schools in the UK, to ArcGIS for schools. At a turn, that opens up the opportunity for any school, for the first time, to have free access to that software. And the second is the accompanying GeoMentors program, which I'll talk about in just a moment. This is absolutely fantastic news. Not only for schools, but for the sector as a whole. It's the way, it's the pipeline, if you like, of the GI sector of the future. If we want the next generation to be GI literate, we need GI to be present, used, and more importantly, enjoyed in our schools, not just in our workplaces, but also in every school classroom. As many of you will know, and we've just heard from Pete, GIS is now a requirement of the Geography National Curriculum, that's up to age 14, and for students at GCSE and A-level exams. This follows major revisions over the last five years to the whole of the school curriculum. Um, the society was very deeply involved in those revisions for geography. So all secondary geography pupils will be required to use GIS in their lessons and on their field work to explore, analyze, and interpret geographical data within a spatial context. That, for me, is really, truly exciting, but it needs to be enabled. There have always been many geography teachers, such as those you will see from Dover School, who've developed outstanding work with their pupils. They're real beacons um, for the industry. However, there are many more teachers for whom there are two real barriers. The first real barrier has been the cost of accessing uh, the software for schools. That has now been removed at a stroke by Esri. Uh, the second and equally as important barrier is actually the confidence of those teachers to work with that software, to embed the learning in their lessons, and to really bring it alive for their pupils. And um, this is the second initiative <coughs> that Esri has brought forward, which is the Geo Mentors Program. And this program will provide targeted support to build teachers' confidence by matching each school up and you know what's coming with a local GI professional, many of whom will be in the audience today, here. Perhaps it's the school that your child is studying at. Perhaps it's the local school that you actually went to. 
perhaps it's one that's at the end of your road. So we're looking for lively, capable, active, willing volunteers to become geo-mentors. You have the ability to support a local school geography department and we'd love you to get involved in this programme. And to help build teachers' confidence in using the software and to build the curiosity and engagement of their pupils. The software and the geographical content is quite simply liberating for kids in the classroom. So help us make it happen. So on behalf of the geography community as a whole, I warmly want to thank Stuart and his Esri team for their enormous forward thinking and their fantastic commitment to finding ways to tackle both of these challenges. Access to the software and support and advice for teachers to use it well and effectively in their classrooms. The Society is delighted to be standing alongside Esri in this work, particularly through our education team and the leader of that team, Steve Brace, um, who is here today. We already work closely in the provision of GIS training for teachers with ESRI and in the Geography Ambassador Scheme. We, for our part, will be encouraging our GI proficient fellows and chartered geographers to become geo-mentors. We'll be working with ESRI to, to take the message about the importance of GIS into schools and much more besides. So before we break for coffee, I'd like you to do two things, please. I'd like you to sign up to the Geo Mentors program. There's lots of these postcards around outside. Uh, we want to be swamped with people coming forwards to offer their time, energy, commitment, and passion um, for GI and GIS to help the next generation. Um, and there are lots of people from Esri who will be keen to take your details, or you can go online. And secondly, would you please thank with me uh, to join with me? Sorry, to thank Esri UK for such groundbreaking work which we know will make a huge difference to our schools, to the next generation, to raising pupils' awareness of geography, and to the whole pipeline of expertise in the industry. Esri UK, thank you. Hugely. <laughs>